Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, ACEA press conference. Uh, we are delighted with Eric Jornet to be here with you and answer your questions. I would like just to share with you a few thoughts, actually a few conclusions coming out of the discussions that we had uh, with the uh, uh, car maker CEOs uh, and even this morning uh, we continue to uh, discuss. It is quite clear that the European automotive industry is now in motion towards uh, a sustainable and zero emission mobility. Uh, you can see it. Uh, you can see the cars uh, in the booth. You can see that most of us are now going with electric vehicles on sale. And you can see that the tank to wheel uh, zero emission mobility is now becoming a reality. And this is a fact. This is a fact that each of you can control and can double check uh, in the dealerships of our brands. So it is, uh, it is absolutely a consensus inside of the ACA community that uh, the automotive industry in Europe is in motion towards tank to wheel zero emission mobility. From this, uh, from this consensus and from this reality that you, you can double check in the dealerships, uh, what uh, we would like now to propose is that we take care of uh, the freedom of mobility as being uh, something which is fundamental to our democracies and fundamental to our region. Ensure sustainable, zero emission, comfortable, safe mobility. And that means that we need to look at a 360 degree approach. We cannot only look at the mobility devices because the mobility devices are now going to be zero emission and they are on sale. So the next big thing is not going to be about the cars because they will come at the pace at which we can uh, engineer them and manufacture them. So the next big thing is not about the cars. The next big thing is about affordable mobility. The next big thing is about how we make this work for the biggest number of people and how do we ensure on a 360 degree approach that we are not only focusing on the mobility device, but we also take care of everything else related to carbon footprint, related to energy uh, production footprint, related to battery uh, manufacturing footprint, related to uh, battery recycling footprint. Many, many things need to be combined. Many, many things need to be coordinated on a 360 degree approach to ensure a sustainable, zero emission, safe and comfortable mobility. And that's something that of course is the big, uh, the big uh, challenge. And this is where the Automotive Association wants to take a leading position to help our societies to ensure that this whole coordination on a 360 degree approach to ensure safe, affordable and sustainable mobility is going to be a reality. And it needs a strong coordination, it needs a, a strong support, a leading support, because if we don't do it, then the mobility devices by themselves will not be enough to contribute efficiently to the global warming uh, fixing. So this is where we are. I, I want to tell you that the atmosphere and the quality of the dialogue that we have uh, inside of the uh, ACEA, ACEA board is very high. There is a very proactive thinking about how can we support more, how can we lead this transformation beyond the cars and beyond the mobility devices. Uh, and this is what I would like to tell you today. The manifesto that has been that has been uh, given to you is a, a contribution to move in this direction. We try to be as high level as possible from one side, but from the other side as concrete as possible. And we want to be leading this, this direction with your support and your understanding. So um, please uh, take note of this uh, contribution of this manifesto and feel free to ask for clarification of any topic that you would like through the Q&A. This is the uh, introduction I wanted to share with you. And again, to tell you that there is a very strong commitment, very strong willingness among the ACA board members, members to be leading this transformation. But we also realize uh, with you that having electric vehicles in the dealerships is not going to be enough. 
uh, and that's why we have a, an ethical uh, responsibility, a social responsibility to bring more vision, more coordination on a 360 degree approach so that our societies can enjoy this sustainable, zero emission, affordable and safe mobility. Thank you for your attention. Let's move to the Q&A. Who wants to start? Uh, yes, we can open the floor for your questions. Uh, just say your name and media outlet and in English. Uh, we'll start here. Uh, Josh. Josh Pisano from Politico. Just on the, the new commission and the, the battery life. So we've gone yesterday to the mayor of Sheffield which will continue to coordinate the battery line. So I wonder, has PSA Group got any uh, approval from competition <laughs> authorities for any of its planned projects uh, at the EU level? Yep. And also, could you comment more broadly on Maybe if I can just step in, we, we don't take company-specific questions. It's uh, as Mr. Tavares is speaking uh, on behalf of ASEA. So I, I'll not, I will not answer you as the chairman of the PSA Managing Board, of course. Uh, but it is quite clear that the ACEA supports, uh, supports this uh, initiative. We believe that uh, it makes total sense, uh, not only because it's a strategic uh, uh, topic for uh, the supply chain of the automotive industry in Europe, but also because uh, in terms of carbon footprint, moving batteries across the planet is not uh, a, very efficient, uh, a very efficient move. So uh, from a pure environmental perspective, we should not be moving batteries across, across the planet. From a strategic and uh, autonomy perspective for our industry in Europe, uh, we consider that it is strategically important that we have this European uh, battery champion supply. Uh, and this is why we support this initiative, and as you know, we are now waiting for uh, the clear uh, approval from uh, the European Commission on the support that would be given to this initiative, but it is something that the ACEA strongly supports, both from a strategic viewpoint to support the competitiveness of our industry in Europe, but also from a purely environmental perspective where we don't want to move batteries around the world. If I may perhaps respond to the, the, the second question with regard to our reaction to uh, the new commission set up. Well, first of all, of course, it's, uh, we welcome the fact that uh, a lot of attention is given to uh, a digital Europe on the one hand and also to decarbonisation, especially with the portfolios assigned to Vice President Vestager and Vice President uh, Timmermans. As you can see also from our manifesto, digitalization, decarbonizations are one, uh, the, the two really big, big topics for our industry, which are driving the transformation. So we welcome the fact that it is also recognized in the way the commission is structured and the way portfolios are being assigned. Unfortunately, we don't see a commissioner for mobility, but a commissioner for transport. So I think we missed here an opportunity to go for a more coordinated and synchronized approach to address the challenges of mobility, which is going to be increasingly important for Europe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'll go back to you. Uh, yes, here. Uh, you had your hand raised. Yes. Okay. So, uh, just, uh, uh, here's the mic. <laughs> oh, thank you, uh, Christian Hetzner, Automotive News Europe. Um, First off, on, on, on what you had said earlier, I, I thought was very interesting. Mobility is a fundamental freedom of our democracy. Um, do you feel that you are losing, or the industry is losing the argument within society, in particular towards uh, advocacy groups like Fridays for Future, where they have very strong uh, symbol uh, in the form of children that are obviously very afraid of their, their future? And if so, uh, the VDA, for example, and uh, the other day Volkswagen as well, uh, had uh, sort of discussion groups with uh, some of the protesters to start a dialogue. Uh, they thought that that was very important. Uh, does that need to be done on a European level? And uh, in general, uh, sort of in terms of overall EV penetration, since you know, you've, you've spoken, uh, or the, the industry has spoken very much about the problem of uh, infrastructure uh, and uh, sort of a patchwork uh, approach towards regulation in this industry. Um, have, have you spoken already to Ursula von der Leyen or uh, any of them in the, in the upcoming commission that uh, there needs to be a sort of holistic approach by all European member states uh, on an EU level to address this issue? Thank you. 
Well, thank you for, for this um, question. I think you have a great point, and this is uh, something we, we discussed, uh, including yesterday. As we know, and as we can really see right now, uh, the um, sustainable um, and affordable mobility is a very complex issue at the end of the day. And I think our societies, uh, if not our politicians, are discovering that it's not by far, and I insist, by far, only a matter of mobility device. And it is not because you have a zero emission tank to wheel mobility device that you have sold, solved the problem for, for which people may be protesting. So of course, from, a, from a, a stance perspective, we are open for the dialogue with anybody that would be willing to have a dialogue with us. By the way, we have already a significant number of ongoing discussions with NGOs. Uh, starting with the uh, transport and environment, as an example, and we are very willing to discuss and, and uh, work with those uh, with those entities. At the end of the day, as we know well, uh, it's all about efficiency and effectiveness. And if we want to coordinate the 360-degree approach, including the fundamental issue of the infrastructure, infrastructure that needs to be invested and uh, created to support the zero emission mobility devices. Uh, we see that this coordination is now, is now a must. It's a must. If we don't coordinate uh, between the energy, between the infrastructure, between the supply chain, the, the carbon footprint of the manufacturing of the different components, if we don't think about the tax revenues, 448 million euro, billion euros, billion euros of tax revenue on, on, the, on the fuel in, uh, in Europe, if we don't coordinate all of these different uh, components, Yes, of course, we can discuss with many protesters, no problem about that, but how do we coordinate uh, is, I think, what the citizens are expecting from us, because they are going to see the zero emission vehicles in the dealerships, and they will say, yes, uh, we recognize that this is a, a zero emission tank to wheel mobility device, but can I charge it? Let me see where I can charge it. In my daily life, do I have the possibility to charge it? Uh, at a convenient pace and with a significant level of charging network density. This is one of the things we need to discuss. At the same time, uh, what do our societies do uh, with the tax revenues that will have to shift from a fuel to something else? Because the societies are already under a significant tax burden and we have to discuss how we organize the society on those matters. What do we do about the energy sector? Uh, we were told by one of the members this morning that as, the, as we speak, we have uh, still several hundreds of coal plants being uh, constructed right now, as we speak. So what we say is that if we don't take, as you said, an holistic approach uh, on this matter, we may be disappointed in a few years, and we don't want that to happen, given the massive efforts of transformation that we are all going to be supporting, not only in our industry, but also in, uh, in our society. So, you were saying, are we, are we asking for a holistic approach? The answer is yes, but it's more than that. We would like to contribute to show what are the different angles from which we need to uh, coordinate for this to be a success. And uh, this is our proactive stance, is to say, yes, let's get, let's get it done. Uh, as far as uh, the cars are concerned, you can check in our dealerships that the cars are on sale. But let's look at are we ramping up quickly enough on the charging network density? Are we progressing uh, fast enough in terms of having renewable clean electricity to charge uh, the batteries? Uh, do we take care of the manufacturing uh, process in terms of carbon footprint? What about what we should be doing for the carbon neutrality that is, uh, that is requested by the European Union by 2050. So all of this needs high-level thinking and a more holistic approach on a 360-degree approach. It is clear that up to now, if I was telling you this a few years ago, uh, you would tell me, and rightly so, oh, you are a nice guy, but please bring first the zero emission tank-to-wheel mobility devices. And that would be a fair, a fair criticism or a fair comment. Well, Right now, the cars are coming. So how do we make this a success? And I think that ACA wants to take a proactive and positive stance 
uh, not a leading one, because we don't want to be leading other industries, of course, but we want to be supporting this fair, balanced coordination among different stakeholders that need to contribute for this to be a success. And in that respect, we can uh, refer to a joint call of action we launched last week in Brussels, ASEAN, together with Euroelectric, the electricity producers, and together with Transport and Environment, where we were calling for the need to invest more in recharging infrastructure if we are really serious about this move to zero emission vehicles. So I think this is the first time ever that we do this kind of joint call for action, focusing really not on the differences we have, because there are always differences across sectors and with NGOs, but really focusing on the commonalities. And if I may just draw your attention to the fact that we have a report in your press back with uh, the data on infrastructure uh, for alternatively powered vehicles in Europe today and incentives, so that way we're tracking a bit the progress over the coming years. I think we had a question here and then here. Hello, Togo um, Shiraishi Nikkei. Uh, my question is about the Brexit. First of all, um, there's a growing concern about the, the, um, the Brexit without the deal. Uh, logistically speaking, are you ready for the Brexit without the deal? That's the first question. Number two, the um, European Union is reluctant about the extension of the date of the Brexit. Do you think they should uh, extend one, one second? It's difficult to, um, to answer your question because, uh, as you know, uh, things are very volatile. Uh, the ACEA position, of course, is that we should avoid, by all means, uh, no deal uh, Brexit that would create a lot of disturbances in the industry and that uh, somewhere would hurt our communities. So ACA supports the fact that by all means we avoid a no-deal Brexit. Uh, each of our uh, uh, members is preparing uh, everything related to supply chain, but as you may imagine, there will be uh, always uh, some, uh, some period for which we have to be very, very... Uh, uh, cautious about how we are avoiding a supply chain uh, disruption. I think it's going to be difficult to avoid a supply uh, chain uh, disruption unless there is uh, a very progressive process, uh, unless, of course, there is a, a custom union that is protected within any kind of deal that would come up. But uh, if we take some height on, on this matter, we would say that from a European perspective, and uh, we include ACA as part of the European community, of course, uh, we think we should be avoiding at all means uh, no deal Brexit. I think that will hurt our communities, that will hurt our companies, and we have other challenges, uh, including and starting with environmental challenges, to address rather than to try to fix something that we would have broken. That's a political question I cannot answer. Oh, I don't know the answer, by the way but ask the politicians, they will tell you. Hi, Oliver Zahko from Bloomberg. Um, I want to get back to charging infrastructure. Uh, a part of this problem is it's a chicken and egg problem, right? Uh, people won't buy the cars until the infrastructure, the companies won't put in infrastructure until there's cars on the road. Um, I'm wondering what's your proposal for getting in between that? And the second question is, uh, concretely, um, how much money do we need to support infrastructure, you seem to be calling for government support. Do you have a number you'd be able to give us? And um, how would you propose, because I know one of the things in the report is that um, right now the charging infrastructure is um, unevenly distributed in Europe. You know, um, so certain countries have all of the charging stations, some of them don't. Um, how do you propose investing money into putting charging infrastructure into, for example, Poland, when nobody's driving electric cars there? Uh, I think you, you have a great point, and uh, I would like to start from the beginning. You see, you were talking about um, chicken and eggs, and I think you are right. Uh, five years ago, the chicken and egg story was um, there, are, there are no zero emission cars. That was five years ago. So if I was talking to you about mobility and uh, sustainable mobility, you would, you would challenge me and the industry, and rightly so, on the fact that we didn't have on sale the zero emission vehicles. Well, now they are going on sale. So the chicken and egg story has uh, been moved from there are no zero emission cars to there is no infrastructure. You are right, it's still uh, a chicken and the egg story. But you see, um, what makes it more exciting is that the core of the core of the core is the mobility device. And if the mobility device is on sale, 
I think that should encourage uh, the communities and the governments to speed up the infrastructure uh, investment to create the density of charging network that would put the consumer in a comfortable position to say, yes, I can buy a zero emission vehicle because I can charge it, by the way, and it's easy to charge. Of course, we will not forget that most of our uh, uh, members are also proposing uh, to install in the house of uh, our customers uh, a charging device, but not all of them uh, have a house, of course, which means that at the end of the day, we are back, both of us, we are back to the 360 degree approach to make this story a success and step out of, uh, of the chicken and egg story. We need to coordinate uh, all the activities that lead to this uh, final uh, happy outcome. And we were saying about the, the charging infrastructure, and we were saying, well, in some cases you can charge at home, but then you need to change the regulations and the laws for the new buildings that are under, under construction, for instance, to be immediately equipped with the appropriate charging devices. So you see, we could discuss at length, both of us, on chicken and the egg situations, moving from there were no cars, then there is no infrastructure, then there are no buildings with the appropriate charging uh, devices, and then, and then, and then. And you would be right. And that's why we need to elevate this to uh, a level where, from a European perspective, and that's what Eric was mentioning, we should stop talking about transportation. This is not about transportation. This is about how do you ensure freedom of mobility in a coordinated, affordable, and clean way. It is much broader. It's exciting. It's absolutely exciting. But if we don't do it in a coordinated way, we anyway will have the pain of the transformation, but we will not get the benefit, which would be, of course, something that we all want to, to avoid. So your point is valid, and I think we should take it on board and say, well, that is one more example that demonstrates that we need to coordinate the 360 degree stuff. Well, there is a guideline. Uh, there is a guideline uh, that, we, um, that we have in the European Union for the density of the charging network. So it's quite easy for each government to calculate how much investment it represents. And of course, the next big thing uh, behind uh, what you say is, uh, what about the budget deficits? Uh, what about the tax burden on the societies? Uh, that's one of the parts that I was, I was mentioning on the, on the tax revenues, of course. Uh, because if on one side you have to spend more for the investment of the infrastructure, from the other side you have less revenues from the fuel, how do we manage this? Of course, this is a big political issue for the countries and for the European Union. Uh, that is something that needs to be addressed. And then, of course, the next, next big thing will be about the affordability. Because if the infrastructure is there, if the cars are on sale, can people afford to buy those cars? And we have seen recently in some of the European countries that if you start damaging the freedom of mobility for people who are using low-priced cars, then they don't like it, which means that you are back to how you make zero-emission vehicles affordable, which then brings us back again to can we have batteries supplied from Europe at a competitive price, etc. All of this always brings us back to the same point, is we need a holistic coordination of this freedom of mobility, sustainable freedom of mobility. This is a big, big matter. It's about the Minister of Mobility or the Commissioner of Mobility. It's not about transportation. Okay, I think we can take maybe one or two quick last questions. Uh, sir. Bonjour, Laurent Masson, Mater Nature. I want to talk about fuel economy figures. Um, the industry has just moved from NEDC to um, WLTP, and that was a big step forward. But there's still an issue with plug-in hybrids. At this show, there's a... Um, that Porsche Cayenne Turbo SE hybrid, super fast car, 600, 700 horsepower, but on the sticker next to it, it says it's a three liter car. Your company is having the same problem with the new, with the Peugeot 3008. It's the specification sheet uh, tells it's a one liter, 0.3 liter car. Could it be possible that plug-in hybrid would be advertised with their zero emission range and then their fuel economy figures with the battery discharge it would be much more useful for the consum consumer, I believe. Thank you. Well, it's, a, it's a good point. You see, um, when we move from an EDC to WLTP, uh, I think there are two facts that we can share and hopefully agree on. The first one is that 
the ACA does not decide on the, on the profile uh, of the cycle that you use for the measurement. This is something that is decided by the authorities. Of course, we can contribute, and we did, because we contributed somewhere to build uh, the WLTP uh, measurement cycle to be more representative of the customer usage than it was before. And I think that was a very good move uh, from uh, the, the regulators and a very good move from the industry moving that direction. Uh, at the same time, uh, if now we move on the technology side, it is also a fact that if you, uh, if you have an hybrid vehicle, you can be zero emission for a certain range, which is not a very big range, but possibly a, a certain range that will be helpful in urban areas. Uh, now, is it always zero emission? No, it's, it's a hybrid. It, it has uh, an internal combustion engine and electric motors. So uh, perhaps uh, the understatement of your question would not is to say that it's not the ultimate solution. Perhaps it's not. Uh, but it's uh, something that is contributing to go in the right direction. Currently, the announcements that have been made in terms of CO2 emissions are strictly regulated, strictly the uh, translation of the law. So we stick to it. Now, if there is a, a willingness to have another information, we can discuss about it. This is part of the discussions we have been having with the NGOs. You remember that at one point in time, uh, there was the possibility to know what was the real consumption in some, with some brands of your car, but just checking on the websites of those brands. So this is open for discussion. I have no, I don't think ACA has any in principle uh, position on that. Uh, we are, we want to be proactive. We want to push this forward. Uh, of course, I think it is also helpful that from your perspective, when you challenge us to think about how to improve, we start from a point where you give us, I know it's difficult, but please try to achieve that. Uh, you give us some credit that we are human beings as you are. We have kids as you have. In my case, I have grandkids. So we are also completely willing to fix the problem, which means in any topic you would like us to address, we also have to be in an active listening mode. And I would say even more than that, uh, in a mode where you think that we are as concerned and as positive about fixing the issue as you are. And that's also somewhere. It's also a difficulty for our societies because our societies are fragmented and uh, the good faith and the good spirit and the credit that we give to each other on our willingness to fix it is not always very high. And if this credit is not very high, then you are not triggering the best positive attitudes. And we, you would not be triggering the best positive good faith and uh, good spirit uh, and good contribution to, this, uh, to this fixing this problem. And I think our behaviors, and I'm not, I'm not of course, uh, criticizing you, but our behaviors, our behaviors also are a strong contribution to fixing the problem. And the more I give you credit of your good faith, the more you give me the credit of our good faith, the faster we are going to fix this and the faster we'll move. But I'm fine with your question. We can discuss it anytime. I think we have to actually close now to respect the schedule of the following press conferences. So thank you very much, Mr. Tavares. Thank, thank you, you very much for coming. And again, just a reminder that we have uh, the latest data on infrastructure incentives for alternatively powered vehicles in the new report, which we're launching today and which we will be issuing on an annual basis over the coming years. Thank, thank you. you.